I am Amy Vetter, and welcome to the Breaking Beliefs Podcast. This valuable time is for you to pause in your day and go on your own self journey. Discover the beliefs that are holding you back from living your best life at work and at home. Learn from the guests on this show as they share their inspirational stories on how they found ways to break internal beliefs that were no longer serving them. Because if you believe you can, you will. And our podcast begins now. My guest for this episode is Richard Francis, the CEO of Spotlight Reporting. He is a chartered accountant and a trusted advisor with over 20 years of advisory experience. He has been there and done that just like the customers he serves as a director of his own boutique professional services practice. He saw a need to improve analysis and forecasting for his own clients, which led him to start Spotlight Reporting. In our discussion today, Richard shares how he has used his own belief system to give him confidence and take the risks and never stop learning. He lets us in on his secret passion outside of work as well. Hi, this is Amy Vetter, the host of Breaking Beliefs podcast. And today I'm very excited to have the CEO of Spotlight Reporting, Richard Francis, on with us. So Richard, you want to give a little background on yourself before we get started? Sure, sure. Thanks for having me, Amy. Um, thrilled to be here and uh, cool, cool to be on a podcast with a former Zero colleague uh, as well, <laughs> uh, from way back when. Um, so my brief bio, I've been the CEO of Spotlight Reporting, which is Zero's number one reporting and forecasting uh, app partner. We also work really closely with Intuit and some other partners uh, to bring forecasting, advanced reporting, consolidation, and other goodness to the advisory, accounting, and uh, CFO sector. So I've been doing that for 10 years now, and prior to that, I was actually an advisor to businesses myself. So I've come from the front lines, uh, worked with lots of cool entrepreneurs, um, was there way back in the start with Rod Drury and Hamish when they launched Zero. Um, and have really uh, had a, an exciting decade growing a global company, which now has offices in uh, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, the US, and we're about to open uh, open up shop in Singapore and Canada as well. So very excited. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. So that's it's going to be a few gags under the eyes. And a few yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so that's why I'm so excited to have you on because really the purpose of this podcast is really to try to get into what are those habits and patterns that show up for us that we bring whether it's from childhood or what people say to us over time and they start you know it's hard for us to start breaking apart what is our beliefs versus what we yeah. were told to believe and you know, with the kind of risks that you've taken in your career um, and have found a lot of success, but I'm sure along the way, you've had to do a lot of self-reflection and figure out where you need to pivot or be honest with yourself about making changes in order to move forward. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your path and where this might have occurred for you. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. A lot of these uh, revelations happen at 3 or 4 a.m., as we <laughs> um, So, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting to reflect as you do, because I started Spotlight when I was 40, so which is kind of later than mm. uh, a lot of um, startup people do. But before that, I'd started my own business consultancy practice and then way back um, had worked for a large firm running the consulting side, which is kind of why the advisory and helping people and doing more with my background was really important. But going way back, uh, my father was actually a chartered accountant mm -hmm. and uh, he worked really hard. This was the kind of 70s when I was growing up, early 80s. And we didn't see a lot of him because he was working hard and there was high, you know, um, mortgage rates in those days and, you know, the oil crisis and all those kind of things that we can be vaguely remember or remember as children. And I said to myself then, I'm not going to do that. I don't want to be an accountant and kind of, you know, course it had a little bit of that boring stigma so I was really surprised uh coming out of university that my first job was in an accounting firm I still don't <laughs> couldn't get away <laughs> I, did, I did an arts degree as well as a commerce degree and I actually majored in classical studies and history and that's still my passion oh. so 
uh, you know, I'd still rather be poking around ruins uh, in Rome or, or somewhere than. than so, when did you start having an interest in that? Right from the start. So, I've always been a really avid reader, and I think um, I, I'm still kind of old school. I still read books. I still like the tangible kind yeah. of feeling of that. So, I have a kind of a bit of a library, and I just love um, having downtime. I don't actually read business books. I mean, I used to back in the day, but you know, I'm sure like you, to a certain extent, when you're out there doing it and living it you don't really need necessarily to be reading too much of those things anymore right. unless you know, they really bring some new insight but no I've always been an avid reader and always been really interested by the past and how that can inform the future so um, I'm sure I bore my leadership team with you know quotes like you know, if, you, if you're always doing the same things that you've always done you know why do you expect the results to be different um, so I think from that background of intellectual curiosity and that's something I really really want to keep um, because that intellectual curiosity le led me to kind of pivot into interesting areas of the accounting industry when I found myself kind of accidentally in there. So, how, and, so before you go, so yeah. how did you find yourself accidentally in accounting? So why didn't you go that path? What, what stopped well, you? I mean, I think I had that moment that we all do when we're doing stuff we love, but you can't see how that could be turned into a job. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really want to be a classical studies lecturer at a university or an archaeologist on, you know, $10 an hour um, digging up holes in, you know, yeah. in, in, the, in the third world or anything. Um, although part of me kind of quite liked that idea, but I, you know, like a lot of humans, I wanted a decent salary and, and you know, mm -hmm. kind of a, 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 a probably a more stable career. Um, so when I came out, it was early 90s, it had been a little bit of a kind of economic slump globally. So I think pretty much all of us went out and about and met with the law firms, the accounting firms, and, you know, the usual suspects who always hire lots of people. And as I say, yeah, next thing I knew, I'd been offered a job, good money, um, and was sitting there blinking in the surprise and horror of uh, a pile of paper on my desk on day one. Um, and accounting partners demanding I get productive and, and do stuff and, and <laughs> well, interestingly the lady who started on the same day as oh, me so hard left when you're and never came back. yeah so, um, <laughs> so she was either the genius or I was I'm not sure which one exactly. <laughs> so I ended up there kind of accidentally and then I thought okay I need to do my time I need to learn kind of accounting and all those things but really really early Amy I decided I wanted to do useful stuff um and I know that sounds glib, but I kind of sat there thinking, why are we doing all this really historic uh, paper-based stuff that the clients clearly don't really care about? In fact, they want to end the meeting really fast so that the bill doesn't get too, right. too large, six-minute units. But we have all this insight. We have all this data. So, you know, way back in the 90s, I was thinking, how do we use data? How do we provide recommendations and advice that actually resonate with the clients? It kind of seemed really obvious to me and it still annoys me today when we're still fighting with accountants and hand-to-hand -hand combat combat to get them seeing that they can do more and be more. So what do you think stops it? Uh, fear, fear of the unknown. I think it's very easy in our profession for, um, for there to be topics or almost trigger words for people so advisories become one yeah uh, cloud software was one as we both know you know from early days of zero you know everyone was saying yeah it's as bit as it's safe and you know we're going to stay on desktop we don't believe in it i mean how many people say that now right pretty much no one right i remember the ceo of a major software company who remained nameless uh being on stage at a conference telling us that it was a fad and that desktop was here to stay forever <laughs> and everyone kind of agreeing with him apart from yeah. a handful of us at the back just recoiling in horror at the jurassic park kind of attitudes um on the advisory front you know i've never been one of these ones who say compliance is dead it's not you know we still have to do that part of our job right. but i because i've been so driven by um doing things differently and trying to give my clients the best outcomes for their lives you know from a holistic view I don't understand it when accountants kind of pull back and say, no, I'm only going to do the tax returns. So I think there's fear. There's so a, um, when for you, have you had fear when you've experienced that yourself and it's gotten in your way? 
I'm quite confident. So I don't think I ever had that fear. I, ironically, you know, you, you asked about backstory. I was actually a really shy kid. Yeah. Um, I kind of look back now and I can't believe it because I'm, I really, <laughs> I, you know, I, I frankly could, you know, I'd be happy to meet anyone and, and talk about anything these days. But as a kid, I used to hang off my mother's leg and kind of peer around, you know, at, at other people. And I've actually heard that quite a lot about entrepreneurs that often they were actually a little bit kind of shy and in the process of coming out, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, they've actually kind of made up for that by just getting out there and taking risks. So I never felt any fear in the accounting industry. It was from day one, how do I turn, you know, I've, I've, I've ended up in this industry. I don't really, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, you know, I don't have, I don't want to do, you know, classical studies, lecturing or whatever. I've got to make the most of this. And so right from those early days, I wanted to do consulting and useful stuff. But then to have the likes of Zero come along, um, Rod Drury and Hamish Edwards really, shaking things up and suddenly accounting's beautiful what what's mm -hmm. with that yeah suddenly or you you've been to them suddenly you're at zero cons where it's the most exciting gig in town um and it's it's you know we look back and we just take it for granted now but in those days it was actually quite revolutionary right um, and i think the likes of zero and now intuit with qbc and other things have really grasped that and, and tried to empower accountants and take away that fear but without wanting to resort to cliches i think you know in general the industry is still conservative we're still we don't like to jump too far um, but because i'm someone who wants to leap and have a leap of faith sometimes i find that frustrating but hey i've got a team who believe in the mission as well so we're dragging some accountants <laughs> and there's others that are ahead of the curve well so as far as you being shy um, what did you do to push past being shy and why did you do it? I just kind of took an attitude of, I'm not quite sure what the moment was, um, Amy. I didn't really have a road to Damascus moment, but I certainly felt as I became an adult that I'd wasted. I mean, I, I, I was, you know, I did, did well at school and all that kind of stuff and had friends and all those things, but I, I just look back and think, I wasn't empowered. Um, I, I, I had conservative parents. I had an accountant dad and mum was, um, you know, mum was very smart, uh, but, you know, conservative, they were kind of, um, kind of Anglo-Saxon Protestant, you know, Presbyterian right. background. Uh, so we weren't taught to put ourselves out there or, or try and be the best. Um, and in some ways, that's a Kiwi attitude, probably much less prevalent in, in the United States, where you guys are pretty much out there all the time. Um, yeah, it depends on your family, right? It's still... True, like but we're quite yeah. consistent, I think. We're, we're seen as kind of, whether it's true or not, but I think we're seen as a little bit reticent down here. So I, I think I had all that baggage. And then I got to my 20s and I just thought, why? Why not actually get out there and do some stuff and, right. and you know, shake things up? Um, and I was you know, lived in the UK with my wife, Julie, London for a few years, traveled a lot, you know, different experiences. And when we came back, started our own practice and didn't even advertise the fact we were accountants, we were advisors. Um, and we started doing some really good work strategies and mentoring with tech companies here in New Zealand, actually. Um, so we got to know zero and we did kind of accounting on the side. So that was the start of it. And then when zero came, I thought, right, I can either be a zero accountant or because zero only does accounting uh, and QuickBooks only does accounting and MYB only does accounting. What about all that cool stuff with visuals and forecasting and consolidation yeah. and multi-currency, you know, all of that stuff we now do, franchise reporting. No one's doing that. So I was 40, as I say, and we'd, we'd actually carved out quite a solid and stable position in life you know a couple of kids nice house and we risked it all we mortgaged everything we raised money um and we leapt off the cliff so i mean i was lucky that my my wife was 110 percent behind that it's now cfo yeah <laughs> but that could have ended horribly that was part of the deal that she got to manage the money <laughs> 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 
there, there were lots of deep and meaningful conversations, but. Um, what made you believe that it would work out? To take I believe that in myself yeah. that, you know, I've been advising businesses for so many years. I kind of knew how it worked. Um, I saw the gap. I believed in zero, which was important. Um, and the beauty of zero doing what they've done is they woke up the giant and, and now you have the likes of Intuit doing uh, a lot of cool stuff in the cloud space um, mm -hmm. and others trying to catch up. So it, it built its own momentum. And, you know, we, we just showed up at everything. I, I did 55 international flights one year. Um, I was showing up at every zero event I could with my brochures. Uh, I managed to wangle myself on stage a few times. You just do the hard yards. And right. so I believed that if you, if you work hard and work smart, you'll succeed um, most of the time. And yeah. well, it's proven. Has there been times in the business where you've questioned it at all, where you're like, did we make the right decisions? Did we go in the wrong direction? Most days, um, you know, it, I start the morning, um, I'm not one of these kind of 5 a.m. I, I go running and do yoga kind of CEOs that you read about on media. Um, <laughs> but I do wake up early and I clear all my emails overnight because I've got a UK and a US team. Um, and then I just, I have my coffee and my calm time and I definitely sit there and not second guess, but think through everything that we're doing strategically. So strategy yeah. is kind of a daily concern of mine. Should we open that Canadian office before we open the Singapore office? What am I hearing from the guys on the ground? Um, is it the right time? Is it the right thing? Should we actually throw that money and resource at a product skew? Um, so they tend to be more strategic and tactical thoughts and pivot um, internal dialogues and anything. And then I run things past my leadership team, but not really an existential um, review of where I've come. You know, I've, I'm here now, I've got 52 staff, 52 families that kind of rely on us doing the right things. I've got shareholders who of course, absolutely expect me to do the right things. Right. Partnerships all around the world. So it's too late to back out now. <laughs> I've got to make it work. So have you found a way to bring your historical love or going on vacations and look going to ruins or how do you still incorporate that? Absolutely. So the, I, I normally have about 10 books on the go at once. So um, to many people's amusement, my bedside table just has this massive stack. <laughs> of the book. And if I took a photo of them for you, there wouldn't be a business book. Oh, there might be one business book there that someone's given me. Yeah. Um, but they will all be about uh, the Roman Empire or Second World War or New Zealand history or um, I'm reading something about, uh, you know, all the early kind of pioneers in the United States who, you know, who, who created the great nation that it is now. Um, so, yeah, I love all of that. And if I could be paid to do that, I would. But my <laughs> second biggest love is empowering this industry and changing the face of it alongside you know, other great pioneers like um, Rod Drury, Brad Smith and all of that. And, and, you know, we're small, so we're not, we can't have quite the impact yeah. of those guys at the top of the food chain. But one of our mentors here at Spotlight is to create a ripple disproportionate to our size. Um, you know, that like the old pebble tossed into the lake. <laughs> we're trying to do that. Yeah. Well, and I think there's, you know, a couple big points that I've heard that you've brought up and then, you know, let me know if there's anything I missed. But one is that you're never too old to start something new. So at 40 years old, you, you took the risk that many people yep. wouldn't take at that age. And a lot of times those are the things you hear is like, I'm too old for that. Or, um, you know, I'm not going to change at this point or so forth. And that yeah. constant evolution is what keeps us young, you know, in our hearts and minds and soul, um, to keep us learning. And then the other thing that I heard that I think even, you know, you, you're very fortunate to be born with a lot of confidence because not everybody is, I kind of have always thought about confidence as one of those things where, you know, it either comes naturally to you or you have to really work mm. on it. It's like your right arm, <laughs> kind of thing, you know? I had and, to find it. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and when you, you know, find it within yourself, a lot of times it's getting inspired by other people, not being jealous of other people. And that's really yeah. what I heard you say was, you know, whether it was from going from being shy to not being shy, you opened your eyes to look at other people and like, I want to experience that instead of being jealous that other people are experiencing it and you're not, or looking yeah. at other entrepreneurs and CEOs and saying, wow, they've really thought about this different. That inspires me to do it different, not looking at myself like, oh, I'm not worthy. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. all of those things are really important when we're trying to break past where we are and move to that next phase. Absolutely. A couple of things there. I mean, I, I don't like to die wondering. Yeah. Um, and I do kind of think of things like, you know, what do you, what do you want to have as your legacy? What do you want to have on your tombstone? Um, and I don't know whether it's ego or, or what, but I, I find that most driven people, and, and this may resonate with you, you do want to leave behind or create something bigger than yourself. Yeah. Um, I mean, I ultimately want to kind of merge back into the shadows a little bit like, you know, someone like Rod has, you know, has now stepped back as CEO and he's just doing product stuff and probably a lot of surfing. Um, <laughs> but I still aspire to kind of, you know, stepping back and letting Spotlight just do its thing at some point. Uh, um, but I think there's definitely a drive where you, you, you want to lead a life that's a little bit less ordinary. Um, and, you know, being 40 years old, running a good advisory practice and all of that, you know, I, I'd left my dash too late to solve world peace or cure cancer. So I thought I really want to create a great ripple in this industry and be part of this wave um, and not a spectator on the sidelines as some people can be. And as you say, sometimes they're sniping from the sidelines because they don't like seeing people that have left off, um, you know, kind of on wings of faith coming back to the never too old to um, kind of try new tricks and, 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 and strike a new direction. That uh, as soon as you mentioned that, Amy, I thought of how I spent my afternoon on Sunday, which was at the annual general meeting of an alumni association um, associated with the school my daughter goes to. So I'm the chair of um, a good uh, female school here in Wellington and, and actually a bit of an ardent feminist, which might surprise you. But it's amazing when you have a daughter who you want to have empowered and to become a leader. Mm -hmm. uh, and to see her friends in an all-female all school where, of course, you don't have blokes like me getting in the way, uh, <laughs> really allows females to kind of flourish and, and be all they can be. So I, I just, you know, I'm really driven by that, which is why I, I, I was um, involved with the school and got us to, to be the chair. But at this alumni meeting, a 95-year-old old girl came along. Oh. And... Um, it was just empowering for me to see someone and I sat down and, and I spoke with her at length uh, and she's given, you know, 80 years of service, not only to the school, but to her community. And I thought at her age, at 95 to want to come to an annual general meeting to talk about the school and to hear from me and the principal about what our plans for the future were um, just, I was blown away by that. And it was bigger than a little more of care and service there, isn't there? That yeah. Um, I've also been inspired by my father, who uh, and my mother, but who are both still with us. They're, they're in the eighties now, but they've also given a lifetime of service to the community and are still active um, on various bodies and and charities and things like that. So um, I just think, you know, if if people at that stage of life are still contributing so much to other people and industries and um, organizations, why can't we do whatever we want, we want to do and look and look through it, look through the lens of a lifetime, not right. that 40 is too late or 60 is too late or 95 is too late. Right. To yeah. You're alive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to, I want you to pick one category and then I'm going to ask you four questions that you just first thing that comes to your head okay. um, with these questions. So the choices of your categories are either family, friends, or coworkers. That's one category. Second category is money. Third is spiritual and fourth is health. So which one would you like? Let's go with uh, family, friends, and team. Okay, great. So what don't you have that you want? More time. 
um, I try and be an active parent with my son and daughter. In fact, we, we chose our HQ here at Spotlight, kind of equidistant between the two schools of our kids, um, mm-hmm. which has been kind of cool. And I, I obviously try and get actively involved. But yeah, just um, I'm loving the dream of being an entrepreneur and the travel and all of that kind of stuff to an extent. But uh, I would trade all of that for more time. <laughs> exactly. So what about something that you do have that you do want with your family, friends, or coworkers? Yeah, I, I know everyone says this, but um, my team, uh, you know, I think I've got as strong a uh, front bench of, of leaders in my business as any app partner or any kind of small software company has. You know, I look at um, Julie, my wife, who's who's um, key to the business. I've got Kristen Harris, who used to be a GM at Deputy. David New, who worked for Zero and Receipt Bank, and Danelle and Matt and Nick, and you know, lots of others who have come through the. Um, you know, right from being accountants. You know, Nick George, who's one of our product managers, was an accountant with us at, at our accounting practice, and now he's a respected product manager in the in the software as a service ecosystem. Um, so. We've all got each other's backs and we can have those kind of conversations that we need to have to keep scaling. And I don't actually think that's as common as people make no. out. A lot no. of people say that, but I think there's a lot of organizations where you can't trust the person that sits next to you. And so you we've get got a high level of progress. Yeah, absolutely. I try and nurture that. Okay. So what about uh, things that you don't have that you don't want with your family, friends, or coworkers? Yeah, oh, it's a hard one. Um, <laughs> I mean, things that I, I don't have but don't want. It's a double, isn't it? Um, in, some, in some ways, I think, um, I mean, I don't, I don't have, this will sound a bit strange, I don't have a lot of stress or existential moments of what are we doing, I need to do something else, and I don't want that, I don't, you know, and, and I think because... You Hopefully, think. because I'm not projecting <laughs> that as a CEO. You know, there's, there's a healthy level of momentum and direction you need to have. And, and you know, my family's very understanding of when I can be there and when I can't be there and all of that. But I, um, I, I think we've got the balance right and therefore I'm not going to do things um, to, to bring that out of kilter. Okay. Well, but, but, and, 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 Amy, I think part of that, um, to resonate with you, I think, is, you know, when you, when you have traveled and built things and you know you've kind of learned yeah. a lot by observation and actually doing and this is the difference between starting a business at 40 and 20 i've observed so many people do so many things right and wrong that i've absorbed a lot of the wrongs and yeah. been obsessed with not doing those yeah i've just been reading the book the war of art and that was and one of the things i just read it last night about you know, a more experienced entrepreneur is patient. Yeah. <laughs> you There's know. A lot, of, <laughs> a lot of material coming out now, I, I, I've seen anyway, where a lot of people are saying, actually, these these kind of slightly older entrepreneurs aren't doing too bad after all. And a lot of the, you look at a lot of the successful companies and um, they've actually got someone who maybe started in their 30s or 40s so I think it's debunking the myth a little bit of these 20-year-olds in the garage in Silicon Valley. Um, I mean, there's there's obviously examples of right. that, like Bob's and Wozniacki, yeah. et cetera. But when our VC came on in our Series A, so we haven't done a Series B, um, one of the first things he said to me, only half jokingly, was when are you moving to Silicon Valley? <laughs> and, uh, why would I, you know, why would a 40-year-old want to go and live in a gallo- garage? Right, in <laughs> And, and luck and, and there's a little bit of that received wisdom almost from Australasia that you have to move to America to make it. Um, and there's certainly businesses where that's true, but luckily I had the likes of Rod and you know, the, the Atlassian guys back in the day and all that who had actually done a lot. Vend was another one, you know, who've done a lot from New Zealand or Australia without necessarily moving their entire business to the United States. And it was yeah. so much before this globalization now that's really occurred where you really can be anywhere, you know, as you make these shifts 
So. What well, struck me that the ultimate irony of being a cloud business and, and telling people that you can do advisory from anywhere, but then having to physically move to Palo Alto. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I'm still here. I'm still here in Wellington. So just to end our conversation, is there anything that you want people to take away to just know about you or spotlight reporting or anything that uh, you want people to look into that's important? Yeah, look, I just, I, I think um, just uh, if you're in the accounting advisory or CFO space, and you probably are if you're watching this, just um, think about the great work you can do for your clients and the things that maybe are a little bit outside of your comfort zone and give them a go um, at Spotlight Reporting. And I know, you know, many other um, app partners and, and software uh, giants like Zero and Intuit and, and Sage and MYB, et cetera. There's lots of resources, lots of education, lots of help. Uh, there's lots of people like yourself, Amy, providing a lot of advice from your years in the front line to make it a much less fraught transition than it was from just doing historic backward looking compliance to doing doing that because we need to tick but being future focused and being a catalyst for change for your clients and therefore embedded as a trusted advisor um so you know check out spotlight reporting as a tool to enable that but just um i think you're never too old to challenge what you're doing and whether you can be more do more and and leave a really lasting legacy for your clients and for your business well, thank you so much for having this conversation today. It's been very thank interesting and I'm right. sure everyone will enjoy it. So thank you very much. Thanks, Amy. Take care. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Richard. And now it's time for Mindful Moments. And one of the things that I want to pause and step back and reflect on is Richard's term intellectual curiosity, where he reflected on if you are always doing the same thing, why would you expect the results to be different? Now, the thing about being human is we have the opportunity to repeat patterns and routines, or we have this opportunity to be curious and to study ourselves, to study our behaviors, how we think, how we feel, the energy that we put out into the world. And when we step back as an observer, rather than being right in the moment, it can be really interesting to think about why did I react a certain way or why am I only comfortable doing things one way instead of opening myself up for new ideas. And the thing is with our brain, in order to keep it healthy and keep ourselves creative and innovative and bring that into work, it's important to find these outlets to keep training our brain where Richard referred to that he reads books that are possibly off topic of the business work that he's doing, but it's actually making him think a little bit different. And then how can he actually take that back into his work life where it spurred an idea, it spurred that curiosity. So when you step back from today and maybe take from it what made you curious or what made you think about what are some actions that you could take in your own life to really create this positive effect, don't fall back into your everyday routine. Think about one thing that you could do different as you go into this week. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to listen to the Breaking Beliefs podcast. I hope you will take a moment to pause before entering back into your day to reflect on this podcast and note one to two actions you are inspired to do from today's conversation that you could incorporate into your life. To read the full blog and listen back to this episode or any other, you can find them at www.amyvetter.com forward slash breaking beliefs podcast and related videos on my YouTube channel. For daily inspiration, follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn at Amy Vetter CPA. I hope that you will choose to like this and subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and more so that you can join us for more inspiration on our next episode.